exceedingly uh, important. I want to start, if I, if I can, with a, uh, a statement really of the obvious, which is to say, and I imagine this is why we're all here this afternoon, is to say that freedom of expression is a critical, absolutely critical human right that should only be limited in the most exceptional circumstances. And we have to ask ourselves whether English libel law respects this. Well, the Americans certainly don't think it does. Their state legislators have gone so far as to enact laws protecting US citizens uh, from the chilling grasp of our law. And the United States House of Representatives has a bill before it to protect all US citizens from our courts, from our judges, uh, and from us. Now, it seems to me that this process that's going on in the United States should be a matter of very, great shame uh, to the government. But I don't think it is. And that's why Index and Penn have come together to produce this report. And it's also to stiffen the resolve of the Parliamentary Select Committee, which is looking into these issues. And by all accounts, that committee needs stiffening. The Americans call their legislation Rachel's Law. It's named after the United States American uh, academic Rachel Ehrenfeld. Some time ago, she wrote a book called Funding Evil, and I'm sure it was an excellent piece of work, published in the United States. Unfortunately, it only sold uh, 23 copies in the United Kingdom over the internet. Uh, I don't think it was available uh, in Waterstones or Smiths. It certainly wasn't available in books, etc. And I never saw it uh, on stone at Heathrow or Gatwick or anywhere else. But if Rachel was disappointed by the apparent lack of interest uh, in her book in the United Kingdom, she was probably even more disappointed to find herself nevertheless sued here by a Saudi businessman with the uh, English courts happily taking the case. Obviously, he had good legal advice, but our law seems to me, and it's always seemed to me, our law should be nurturing the free exchange of information and ideas. That's what it's there for. That's what we want it to do. It should be protecting research and science. It should certainly allow free autonomous people to be offensive to each other. And it certainly shouldn't have any role in shielding chances and charlatans. And too often, it seems that's its task. In July last year, the United Nations Human Rights Commission <coughs> said this, the practical application of English libel law has served to discourage critical media reporting on matters of serious public interest, adversely affecting the ability of scholars and journalists to publish their work. And what an absolute disgrace for us to be subject to that sort of serious, considered judgment in the United Nations. The report went on to say that the impact of the internet meant that our unduly restrictive libel laws create the danger that worldwide freedom of expression on matters of public interest could be affected. And that's a double disgrace. No one here, certainly no one in index, no one in pen, is saying that we shouldn't have libel laws. Malicious and deliberate falsehoods should be actionable. I was subject to a few uh, when I was DPP, although I never threatened to sue anybody, I did get an apology, a prominent apology from a well-known news magazine. But deliberate and malicious falsehoods should be actionable. But we don't want, and we mustn't have libel laws that encourage corporate bullying, or stifle scientific inquiry, or chill investigative reporting. And there are <coughs> plenty of examples in the uh, a booklet which is published today of precisely those circumstances in cases being entertained day in and day out in our courts. And above all, we don't want libel laws, and this is a matter, it seems to me, of civic pride, or it should be. We don't want libel laws to associate our country with the suppression of free comment and information around the world. We don't want other countries to have to pass laws to protect their citizens from our attempts to stifle free speech. This seems to be, to be a matter of national pride as well as a matter of 
civic pride. But I think it goes further than this, because I want to situate all of this, the growth in the law of libel, the growth in libel tourism, the extent to which corporations can use this law to bully journalists. I want to situate it firmly within a growing tendency to undermine free speech in the United Kingdom in recent years. This is a serious issue that we need to address before it goes too far to correct. It's a process which may be born of protected speech. I've said before that when you are in a position of responsibility and some dreadful incident occurs like July the 7th, the rather peculiar reaction which you don't experience is one of guilt that this has happened while you have some sort of responsibility. This is something I'm sure is felt by Home Secretaries and Prime Ministers too, and the result is often a degree of legislative hyperactivity. You go too far to try and protect people from risks which will always exist. But even if it's born of protective zeal, we need to conclude that we don't want that kind of protection. We prefer to accept some risks in order to continue living as freely as possible. So this isn't just about defamation, privacy laws, and libel tourism. It's not just about super injunctions. It's not just about the deliberate intimidation of scientists by professional groups or wealthy individuals. It's also to do with legislative provisions broadening categories of hate speech, even to include religion, as though idea systems, thought systems, need or deserve the special protection of the law. People can't stand abuse. And in the field of terrorism legislation, outlawing the possession of articles, including books, openly available on the internet, offences of encouraging terrorism, offences of disseminating information. In many fields, we need to acknowledge, recognise and acknowledge that in many fields, the criminal law is now engaging with free speech in ways undreamt of uh, a few years ago. And this is a process that needs arresting. The context also makes it a very unhappy time for us to be placing whole categories of reporting into the box marked mark, forbidden, or too dangerous, or too risky for a publisher to contemplate. Now we hope that this report will spark debate and prick some consciences, not least in Parliament. It, it would be good, it seems to me, for this country to be known as a beacon of free speech around the world, rather than a symbol for information control. And we hope that this report, as I've said, will spark a debate change minds, put some steel in front of them, and I can